worship God, lift up his name, and more importantly than or as important, not more importantly, but as important is get that good news out to our brothers and sisters out in the world that don't know or don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They may know him, but they don't have that relationship with him. And we want that to be a, a fact. And for that to happen, we gotta do some talking. Not to one another as much as we need to talk to God. And so this morning we're concluding, go ahead, the prayer house. And this morning is entitled The Missing Link because I see that missing in most relationships with God. If I look and talk with somebody or counsel with somebody and they say, you know, that they're having some trouble, that's one of the first things I ask them. Have you been talking to God lately? Oh, yeah, well, well how much have you? What do you mean, yes? What does that mean, you know? And you talk to them a minute a day? It's amazing how uh, 60 seconds can be slow when you pray. Think about it. It's amazing, too, as I hear Brother Larry pray this morning, how some people, maybe not you, I'm sure probably not you, but some people, man, he is praying forever. Is he ever going to finish? Oh, my goodness. We're talking to God. Now, sometimes I might think that about my wife. No, I'm just kidding. I can say that because she's not here this morning. Adam had 103 temperature. It's just going around. We can see it. We got to pray that the Lord breaks this. Prayer's important. What good would it be if I don't pray and bring my wife and my son before God this morning? I felt impressed. I came to the altar. I got on my knees and I'm like, Lord, please touch my little boy. Please touch our church. Please touch our people. You know, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I don't want to go. I want to, is that you, God? Or, you know, and I'm, okay, if it's you, I don't want to try and mess around. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't know for sure, but you know what? I'm going to go because I'm going to pray. And I know if I pray, you're going to listen. This is missing in a lot of our homes and a lot of our relationships with God. As I started a couple weeks ago, this, uh, this series, this is the conclusion of it. It came from after reading a, a book by Jim Cimbala, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. And he came to Florida, and he, he was like seeking God. He was actually out fishing on a boat, and, and he's like seeking God. This is before the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir was even conceived. Maybe they were doing a little something, but they weren't doing anything big like what they're known for today. And he just faced God, and he prayed, and he begged God to intervene. You see, that's what happens. When we start talking to God, he listens. And if we're sincere, he will intervene. And he intervened in Jim's life, and the, uh, the rest of the story is still being written. But really, for the main reason that this message has come together is because of my own walk with the Lord Jesus Christ since 1996 and, and since I've been born again, since I finally gave in to God and quit running from God, this journey that I've been on, it's coming up, I got a birthday next month, March, March the 3rd. This journey I've been on has a lot to do with prayer. And in this journey, I know as I look back over my journey, some of the prayer time has been really intense and some of it hasn't been. Some of it's just been like a throw up a prayer, you know, like blah, <laughs> throw up a prayer instead of getting serious before God. When I realized by getting serious with God, God got serious with me. Uh-oh, and when God gets serious with you, he's going to ask you to do things. He's going to ask you to change things. He's going to ask you to be more loving, more kind. Maybe he's going to ask you to do something that would be so much out of your comfort zone that you don't do it. Well, that's called disobedience. And through prayer, we know that. And we sense that. And through prayer, we say, forgive me for that disobedience. Help me be better. Help me get better. You see, again, it goes right back to it. We want to keep getting better. As a church, we want to keep getting better in what we do, what we offer. We want to do our best. Why? Because I'm doing it for the king. I'm doing it for God. I'm doing it for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm doing it because his Holy Spirit fills me and compels me to do it. Not because you even ask me or desire me to. It's because he asks and he desires. So I see that through prayer and through the missing link, it isn't only Jim's book and, and the direction in my life. It's the direction that he has for the church. Not just the, this church, the church. Church universal, the church. We're going to read from Matthew this morning. Matthew chapter 7, starting with verse 7. We're going to read 7 through 11. Matthew 7. 7 through 11, keep on asking, <laughs> and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find it. 
Keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. You parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So, if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? Lord Jesus, I thank you again for the service. I thank you for your words and your wisdom. Pray a, a fresh wind in me this morning, a fresh fire within me, Lord. You speak as you see fit. Take me from the notes. Take me where you want us to go, Lord. We're just willing, willing vessels asking to be used one more time. For your glory as always, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 7 is definitely one of my favorite verses. Ask, seek, and knock. And you'll know it. I'm sure probably a lot of you could probably quote it. Ask, and you, it shall be given to you. I can't quote it. i got to look. <laughs> seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open unto you. It's a promise. We have Jesus Christ's words here out of Matthew. Because I do, you know how I know that? Because in my Bible, they're in red. <laughs> but more importantly, because it's the truth. All truth is God's truth. I believe that wholeheartedly. If it's true, it's because God. God said it's true. He made it true. All truth is God's truth. Well, there's three things that we can see here, ask, seek, and knock, that we need to do minimum, minimally for our prayers to be answered. Christ's disciples are the best example, and Jesus himself are the best examples of this particular sequence working, asking, seeking, and knocking. But to unlock the outcome, the disciples realized something really quick. If they were going to ask, seek, and knock, they had to ask, seek, and knock with confidence. I have to ask, believing that God not only hears my prayer, but that he will answer my prayer. They asked with confidence. Jesus and his disciples taught us something else about asking too, that we must we must, when we're asking God, we're seeking God, we're, we're knocking on the door, we don't only ask with confidence, but we must trust that God will do what's best for us. We have to trust that the Father God answers the prayer in the way that's best for each individual. He may not answer the prayer for me like he did for you, or vice versa, but he will answer it what's best for us. We have to trust that. That's faith. We got to believe that he hears it, he answers it, and he's going to answer it the way he's going to answer what's best for us, for you. Even when we don't understand the outcome, even when it doesn't make any sense, our, our, our prayers just don't add up, we can know, we can know that God is looking out for our best interests. I love that thought. So that makes things a little easier to handle, a little easier on the difficult things that happen in our lives that we don't understand. We have to say, you know what? I don't understand it, God. And that's okay. You're not God. It's okay not to understand. One of our human flaws is we do. We want to understand everything. Got to figure it out. Got to, got to work through it, you know. I'm a PI. I got to figure this thing out. No, you don't. Some things are beyond our understanding. We are not eternal yet. So that means we are infallible. For God's word, or fallible. God is infallible. We have to trust him that he knows what's best. And he's going to answer according to what is best for us. God is always going to look out for us. Why? Because he's our daddy. He's our Abba. He's our father. And he wants what's best for us because he loves us. And his love surpasses all love. His love as a dad, as a father, surpasses the love of my human father. Me being a dad, his love surpasses my love for my children, for my wife. That's the broadness of God's love, the awesomeness. As a father, of course, I love my kids. I surely want what's best for them. Of course I do. Who wouldn't? And when I uh, am raising them, I'm constantly asking God for help. 
You know, sometimes I want to ask my son, why in the world did you do that? <laughs> what possessed you to run and try to jump over something that's taller than you and you fell on your face? What were you thinking, you know? Were you thinking, you want to ask? You know? My Father God helps me in wisdom. I ask God constantly, Lord, I need your help. I, I, need, I need to ask, seek, and knock for your wisdom. I need your help, God. And you know what? I've realized God just wants the chance. God just wants the chance to answer one of your prayers. The world owns, you know, thousands of books on raising children and, and spending quality time with your children and, and how to do this and how to raise them better. You know, we, uh, unfortunately, uh, I read a, in the article USA Today, we have more problems per 100 young people in the United States than in any previous time. We've got more problems per 100 young people in the United States today than any previous time. You know, it's not because we don't have the books. It's not because we don't, have, we don't know the how-tos or have the how-tos. It's because families haven't cried out on the power and the grace of God is why we've got a lot of the problems we have in our world and in our families. Over the past 45 years, more books have been written about marriage than in the preceding 2,000 years of church history. Over the last 45 years, more books have been written in the last 2,000 of church history. But you ask any pastor in America if there aren't proportionally more problems, more troubles, and more troubled marriages today than in any other era, and they'll say, yeah, there are. We've got more problems in Christian marriages than we ever had or dreamed we could have. You know, we have the how-tos, uh, but homes are still falling apart. What if in the last 30 years we invested half the time, half the energy in writing and publishing and reading and discussing books on Christian family and we put the other, and that's good, but spend only half that time and then spend the other half of that time in praying for our marriages and praying for our children. I'm certain we'd be far off better and far off better shape today than we are the couple that prays together stays together do you pray with your partner do you pray with your spouse do you pray with your children do you make sure they pray are you in such a hurry to eat that food you don't even take the time to say grace isn't it funny how we call it grace before we eat if it wasn't for the grace of God, we'd have nothing to eat. The church that prays together also stays together. That's why he called it a prayer house. My house shall be a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. You, you have turned it into something that I don't want it to be. And I don't mean to be simplistic here at all. but Because I, I know there's, there's difficulties in any union, in any relationship. But God's word is true when it says, call on me and I will help you. Just give me the chance. Give me the opportunity. J.B. Phillips points out some great insight in the matter of the Holy Spirit and this uh, matter of prayer. He says the Holy Spirit has a way of short-circuiting problems. I like that. If the Holy Spirit, if prayer is in your, uh, in your life and you're making it a matter of your life, when you pray, it has a way of short-circuiting the problems that, that are in your minds, the problems that are real. It has a way, the Holy Spirit has a way of short-circuiting human problems. Indeed, in exactly the same way as Jesus Christ in the flesh through he got through the matted layers. He got through the tradition. And he got to the problem. He got to the crux of the problem. You know why? Because he didn't deal with the problem. He dealt with the person. Sometimes we get so stuck on tradition, the way we used to do it, tradition becomes your religion. And religion in relationship. Hmm. We have holy cows. Sometimes we have, you're going to lose me here for a minute.
Sometimes we have holy furniture. Oh my goodness. There's drums in the church. Remember 50 years ago with any drum in the church, Marshall, you'd have been somewhere else. You'd have been Pentecostal. <laughs> We've got mics in the church. Oh my goodness, the pastor's got, oh my goodness, we got a screen up here that tells us what we're supposed to do next. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. Oh my goodness. We got a piano up here that collects dust. It's good for sitting flowers on. Nothing wrong with the piano. No one to play it, I guess. What well, we do? Oh my, we got an organ that sits all the way in the back there. We're going to hell. <laughs> Modern, today's technology plays piano, plays the organ, <laughs> plays everything. I love what you did Sunday night. Who are you serving? God or furniture? I'm way off my notes, aren't I? You see, the beginning of the message was we want to get better. And getting better sometimes means we have to change. Getting through change is difficult. I know that. I'm no young pup. I'm 52 years old. Ooh, I know. <laughs> but I still like rock and roll because I was raised in that era. But what I like above everything else and anything else is God. And if I really stay focused, if I really am focused in on, on him, and if I'm really talking to him, he lets me know it's not the problems in the furniture. It's the people that matter. What are we doing to meet the people? Now, is there anything wrong with an organ? No. Anything wrong with a piano? No. Anything wrong with No. But it is when it becomes the holy cow, the sacred thing. Now you're worshiping a thing, and you're not worshiping a god. The God. Who's got control of your life? God. You see, again, we got all these how-tos, and I go back to JB, and he says, we find that the Holy Spirit of Jesus doesn't deal much with the problems. He's dealing with the people. Go ahead, Terry, put that up there. The people are what's important. Many problems comparable today never arise back in the Old Testament. You know why? Because of the men and the women of the Old Testament and the New Testament, I should say, were all of one mind and one spirit. They were of one mind and one spirit. They were concerned more about each other than they were the things around them. They were more concerned with the, the people than they were the bulletin. Since God's Holy Spirit cannot have changed one iota through the centuries, that means He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is perfectly capable of short-circuiting problems today. He's perfectly capable and he's perfectly prepared to short-circuit. How does he do that? By inflowing a flux of love, by inflowing our brains with wisdom and understanding. That's how we get through the problems. That's why the writer in Hebrews nails it down in the most central part of, uh, for Christianity and, and the activity for all Christians. Go ahead, put it up there. Hebrews 4, 16, it says, let us then approach God's throne. I love how you said that this morning. The throne of grace with confidence so that many, so that we may receive the mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. <laughs> I need Jesus more than I need a piano. I need Jesus more than I need a sermon. I need Jesus more than I do music. I need Jesus. It doesn't say let us come to the songs or come to the sermon. We in America have made the music and the, and the sermon the centerpiece of church something God never intended. This was difficult on preparing these messages over the last two months because this was an ouch, not an amen for me. Perhaps who, who are really doing their job are the ones that are causing them to focus on Christ and not the things of the church. Preachers who are all doing their job well, then according to the scripture, are causing people and driving people 
to approach the throne of grace. Come to the throne of grace. Don't come to the message. Come to the throne of grace. Don't come to the song. Don't come to the music. Come to the throne of grace. That's true, and that's the true source. The throne is the true source of grace and mercy and problem solving. To every person, singer, and preacher, God, some day going to ask, did you bring people to where the action was? It's at the throne of grace the action is. It's at the throne of grace that mercy can be found. It's at the throne of grace. If you just entertain them, if you just tickle their ears and gave them a warm, fuzzy moment, woe unto you. Ouch. Now, those things are okay. Those things are important, but that's not the main thing. Let's keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing, God says, keep my house a house of prayer. <laughs> Am I in trouble? Do you still love me? <laughs> well, I got a few anyway. That's good. God loves me. The Lord's saying at the throne of grace, I can change lives. I can make you see things differently outside of the box, outside of the way the world and church has told you in the past. I can make you see things if you allow me to see them and not get stuck in your traditions and stuck into the way things always were. How about the way things are? Because people are still important to me. People need me and people, we need him. We need God. At the throne of grace, I have to face God someday, and he's going to ask me, have I preached the truth? Pastor Scott Frisbee, did you just dazzle them with your cleverness and with your wordsmithing, and did, did you make them um, giggle, or did you make them cry? Did you make them go through the, uh, the, the roller coaster of emotion? No, he's not going to ask me that. He's going to ask me, did you bring them to the throne, to my throne? Did you bring them unto me? If a Sunday doesn't touch or end with people being touched or touching God. What kind of a Sunday is it? You know, we haven't really encountered God. Do you want to encounter God? Do you want to meet the only one powerful enough and loving enough to change your lives, whether you know him or not? Now, I'm well aware that we don't get everything that we ask for. Things don't go according to our plan. But it does always go according to God's will if we let him, if we allow him to. But let us not use theological dodges either to avoid uh, the fact that we often go to God not knowing exactly how to ask him. We go, we don't, we go to God and with, without things, and we go without things because we don't know how to ask him. We don't know. Too seldom we, we, we have to be honest and, and, and admit, Lord, I, I can't handle this anymore. And unfortunately, we try to do it on our own too many times. It says, I can't do this anymore. I've hit the wall for the 32nd time. I can't take it no more. I need you. And God's like, why didn't you ask me the first time? <laughs> I've just hit the wall. You know, the, the hymn rings out true. Oh, what peace. Go ahead, Terry. We often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we don't carry everything to God in prayer. From the lost earring back to a friend dealing with cancer or on death's bed. Everything to God in prayer. See, God has chosen prayer as a channel to bless us he spread a table before us with all kinds of love and all kinds of wisdom and all kinds of strength. But the only way we can get to it is if we pull up to the table. We gotta get to the table and then taste and see that God is good. He is so good. He knows exactly what we need. This is a touchy, but it's important. We, do, we don't get all our prayers answered because we don't exactly know how to ask. We ask on our behalf and not God's. Well, God, on the other hand, he does know what's best for us. And so we just need to trust him and trust his decisions. He, he's the only one that can look into the future. I don't have a crystal ball. You don't have one. And those that think they do, 
or they're scam artists, or they're filled with an evil that I don't want to deal with. But God does. He don't need a crystal ball. He's creating it. If he chooses so, he can look and see. He has that ability. He has that power. And he's the only one that has that. And he can look into our future, and that's a good thing, because then he knows what's right for us. He knows what's best for us. It takes faith, doesn't it? Yes, it, it does. Pulling up to the table is called the prayer of faith. We pray, and we pray in faith. God doesn't tell us to pray because he wants to impose some kind of control on us, like some government. He's not that way. This is a, that's a system of legalism, and he's not a legalist. E.M. Bounds wrote this, prayer ought to enter into the spiritual habits, you know, our disciplines. He's right. But then he gives us a warning. But it ceases to be prayer when it's carried out by habit only. You throw that prayer up. See, then he gets to good advice. Desire gives fervor to prayer. The soul can't be listless when some great desire fixes and aflames it. Strong desires make strong prayers. You know the difference, right? If you're doing okay, the prayer's half-hearted maybe. If you're struggling with something, boy, you're praying a little more serious. If someone you love is really struggling with it, you're praying even more serious. You're getting on your knees maybe before God and you're praying. Desire makes strong prayers. And he goes on. The neglect of prayer is a fearful token of dead spiritual desires. The soul is turned away from God when desire after him no longer presses you into that prayer closet. Are you spiritually dead? If you're not praying, I'll say yes. Or because you think you got it all made. You think everything's going peachy keen, and maybe it is. Maybe things are going great. You got no problems, no difficulties. Nothing's going on right now in your life, and things are good. Praise the Lord, but don't stop praying. Give him praise. Lord, things are going real good. I'm scared. Something got to be right around the corner. Isn't that how we think? <laughs> Something's going to happen. I know it is, so I'm going to pray right now. Don't stop praying because things are good. There can be no true praying without true desire. I'm almost done hanging here with me. I can't help but illustrate this by, by um, a, a past, my wife's past job two jobs ago. One, two, three jobs ago, I guess it would be. It was a dangerous position. We just moved into Florida, and, and we were praying for, for uh, a job. My wife, just uh, not very long before, had delivered Emily, and uh, uh, we had a little baby, and she needed to work because being a preacher doesn't pay the bills. It just doesn't, unless you have a church, of, and maybe then it doesn't either. I don't know. It just doesn't do it. So, especially as a youth pastor, I came out and was a youth pastor. So we prayed, Lord, she needs work. We, want, we know that you, you're going to supply our need. We know you're going to do it. We're trusting you. And we prayed. And God opened up a, a dangerous position where she was dealing with alcoholics and drug addicts. What her position entailed was she had to go into the homes of these people. She had to go into the home of the alcoholic and the drug addicts. Unthinkable circumstances would, would ha go through my mind as, as a husband. And, and you know, that's desire for your wife to be safe. I hit my knees daily. Please keep my wife safe. I don't know what's going to happen to her. But you know what? We came to a decision, you know. This is the job God opened. It's the door that God opened. So we're going to say, praise you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We're going to trust you to keep her safe. But we would love to have her out of there. We'd love to have her have another job, Lord. So we're thankful, but we sure would like something a little safer or better or however we word it. We don't know, but you know the desires of our heart. But we want to be obedient. We want to be trusting, so we're going to trust you. That's the will, so she's just going to keep working it until you open another door. You see, that's obedience and saying we're, we're thankful for what you've given us, and we're just going to trust you to take care of it one way or the other. We're still scared. Church prayed. I prayed. Tammy prayed. We prayed. And there was a, uh, I mean, this is where the rubber hits the road, people, when you have that kind of trust and, 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 and that kind of danger. You know, if we do, it takes the load off. It allows us to live a little more comfortably. It was hard for us. I'll be honest. It was very hard for us. I wanted to ask God, where are you in this? You know, please keep my wife safe from harm. Give her another job. And eventually God answered that prayer. And that led to her current position. And now as we look back, without that job, 
It was a, it was a way to get to her where she is right now into her ministry, ministering to more people that you and I will ever will. With people in death's, people with, on death's bed. You see, the desire of my wife's safety, again, got us praying. It got the church praying. It got the family praying. All people, people that weren't even coming to our church, people began to pray. It drove us to our knees. And, it's the, and that's only one example. I'm sure you can think of examples even in your own mind of how God has intervened. Circumstances that have driven you to praying. God says to us, pray. Pray because I've got all things, all kinds of things I want to give you. All kinds of things for you. And when you ask, you'll get it. You'll receive it. It's not necessarily stuff, but it's things. I have all kind of grace for you. Yet you live in, with scarcity. If you just submit to me, I would take care of that thing. But you want to do it on your own. Come unto me, all of you who labor. Why are you running around so? Why are you so rushed? Everything you need, I have. Jesus. You know, if you ventured into a, a basketball gymnasium and kind of my son playing upward, it just kind of came to me. As an illustration that some of them kids, boy, they're, they're, they're decked out like they're, you know, Michael Jordan. I got the shoes, got the pants, the headband, and, 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 and the outfits. I mean, you know, what? Well, it says Jordan on the back, you know, or Shaq, and, you know, or James, LeBron James, you know. Boy, they look the part. And then they go out on the court and play. You know, they can't hardly even get the thing in the hoop. They look the part, but they can't make the goal. You look the part. You know, I played good enough and not good enough to get a scholarship. Well, what I've realized as God's people, we've got all the equipment we need. And he gives us a nice scholarship for eternity someday. We got a place on the team. You're on the team. You are the team. It's you. And you look the part. Now play the part. Do the part. He's given us everything we need. For over 2,000 years, we've had this equipment. Everything that's necessary to put points up on the scoreboard and win victories in his name. We've got it. So let's move forward, not backwards. Let's move forward and let's do it with confidence. The confidence that we've received through answered prayers in the past and the prayers that will be answered in the future. God's grace will never give up on you. God's grace, go ahead, Terry. God's grace will never change. Thank you, Lord. Tomorrow, he'll be no more anxious to help us out in our lives than he is right now. He'll be no more anxious to help our families, those who are lost, those who are dying. He'll be no more anxious to help this church go into the future for his glory and for souls to be saved. He'll be more, no more anxious than he is right now. His grace never changes. If we just simply avail ourselves, make ourselves available to his power, to his way of living, to submitting ourselves, we can do things far beyond what we can imagine, far beyond what you can dream. It's time to press on. It's times. It's time. If the times are indeed as bad as they say they are, I believe they are. If the darkness in our world is growing heavier and heavier by the moment, I believe it is. If we're facing spiritual battles, battles right in our own lives, in our own homes, in our own church, then we're foolish not to turn on and turn towards God in prayer. Turn to the one who supplies unlimited grace and unlimited power, keeping focused on him and keeping focus on the source because he is the only source. I'm not it. Stephen's not it. The music's not it. The instruments aren't it. God is it. We're crazy to ignore him. 
the sign out here says, because God is crazy, don't stop there. He's not crazy. He's crazy for you. Let's not try to understand. Let's not try to get it all. Let's just do our part. Let's just trust him. Let's pray. This is Matthew 7, 7. Keep on asking and you'll get what you're asking for. Keep on seeking, you'll find it. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. Lord Jesus, I thank you for a tough message on me. I thank you for your truth. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that your word never lies and your promises are always going to be there and they'll always come through. Thank you for the sweet moment of prayer. Help us, Lord, as a church to keep focused in on you. Help us, Lord Jesus, not to laugh this off. Forgive us if we're laughing it off. But really be a, an adult. Think through it and pray through it. And Lord, some of this will maybe cause us to change. Some of this may ask us to change. Some of this, Lord Jesus, may well, make us so uncomfortable that we just don't want to deal with it. Well, then I'm praying, Lord, for strength for your people this morning the brothers and sisters here, that they will just be willing. We don't want to ever go against what you ask of us, so help me even to be willing, more willing. The leaders of the church, the board, elders, Lord, deacons, or Jesus, the visitors, those that may be here this morning that may never come back again. Lord Jesus, those that are members, those that are attenders, the attendees, I thank you for that. Thank you for each and every one here this morning.